Thank you for joining us for History in Danger, Community-Led Responses to Preserving AAPI Heritage Sites, part of our 2024 webinar series, Preserve the Past, Build for the Future. We are recording this session and it will be made available later on our YouTube channel. Also, if you need closed captioning, please click on the Show Captions button. I'm Lynn Richmond, Communications and Public Affairs Specialist at the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Many of the historic sites and spaces that are significant to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are underrepresented when it comes to official recognition. Less than 3% of the official sites listed in the National Register of Historic Places are associated with AAPI history. Preservation practitioners around the country are advocating for the preservation of sites that represent the culture and history of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. At a time when many historic Chinatowns are at risk of erasure from encroaching development and gentrification, professionals and community members are working together to preserve their heritage for future generations. Before we get started, a quick word about the ACHP. The ACHP is an independent federal agency that promotes the economic, educational, environmental, and cultural values of historic preservation and advises the President and Congress on National Historic Preservation Policy. The ACHP is comprised of 24 statutory members and is the only federal agency whose sole mission is historic preservation. A large part of the ACHP's work is overseeing Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, which requires federal agencies and those receiving federal funding or licensure to consider the effects to historic properties when carrying out their responsibilities and missions. This webinar series fulfills several aspects of our mission to educate the public about historic preservation, bring young people into the field, and build a more inclusive preservation program. We have a great lineup this year for Preserve the Past, Build, the future, build for the Future. There are two remaining. On Wednesday, April 24th, join us for Traditional Trades Careers in Historic Preservation. And our final webinar in the series will be Tuesday, May 21st, Disappearing Indigenous Heritage, Climate Change, and Community Displacement. All webinars start at 2 p.m. Eastern time and last an hour. You can register for these webinars on our webinar page. We will be putting that link in the chat. Also, you can find the recordings of our January and February webinars, as well as our past year's webinars at that same link. We're excited about today's guests. They are Hui Pham, Executive Director, APIA HIP, Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation. Rosalind Sagara, Neighborhood Outreach Manager, Los Angeles Conservancy. And Debbie Wei, co-founder of Asian Americans United. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us. Before we begin, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat box. Once the speakers have given their presentations, my colleague Shayla Shreves will pose your questions to the speakers. Now let's begin with Hui, welcome. Thanks, Lynn. And thanks to the ACHP for having us. Um, my name is Hui Pham. I'm the Executive Director for Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation or API HIP for short. I'm based out here in Seattle, Washington, but our organization has uh, reach across the country and its territories. So I'm excited to share with you a little bit about our organization, our approach to historic preservation practices for our Asian Pacific Islander American communities, and to provide a very brief and crash course on some of our most high level initiatives for place saving campaigns and supporting organizations and community groups across the country in their work to preserve Asian Pacific Island American heritage. And so to begin API HIP, its mission is dedicated to protecting historic places and cultural resources significant to Asian and Pacific Islander Americans. And so as a national nonprofit organization, we make sure to bring in these most underserved and underrepresented communities 
into the, the greater practice and benefits that comes with historic preservation. And so our approach is three prong or maybe three layers where we first engage with the general public with our education and engagement. You might see that on our social media with APIA every day, where we highlight in a brief synopsis of Asian and Pacific Island or American historic sites every single day. Uh, we're approaching day 100, and we would love to see other community members or individuals submit places that matter to them, whether it's historically designated or not. Uh, with Asian Pacific Islander heritage, we understand that there's a lot of emerging histories. And this is our opportunity to engage with uh, the general public who might not even have the words historic preservation in their vernacular. Um, and that's just to get people thinking about historic sites and thinking about our collective heritage as something that could be preserved or worthy of preservation. Then zooming in, we also work with community groups, nonprofit organizations, neighborhoods, advocacy campaigns, and that's where there's a collection of people that's already working towards something, but they might not have the expertise to apply a historic preservation ethic or practice or processes and tools in order to save a place that matters to them. They might be thinking about it from a community, uh, community organizing stance or a public safety stance or a cultural celebration perspective. But our work is to really uh, bring in historic preservation uh, as another toolkit or resource to that. So we advocate and empower existing campaigns for historical societies or citizens leagues or neighborhoods that, that are finding, thinking about historic preservation for the first time. And then finally, uh, API HIP's work does get on the technical level and public policy. And this is when we either do some of the consultation and research work that professionals in the field uh, have been doing, but as community members ourselves, as Asian Pacific Islanders in historic preservation, like our namesake suggests, we apply that direct perspective and community stakeholdership into the higher level technical and policy work, like um, communicating with the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation or the National Park Service or submitting National Register nominations, some of those more technical preservation, traditional preservation means. And so our uh, spectrum of work covers across those three layers. And so the crash course I'm providing today is some of the biggest campaigns that we're either involved with over the past few years or looking to be involved with. Uh, API HIP does not take uh, full credit or to say that we lead some of these campaigns, but we know that they are out there and we look to supporting the local organizations and the local communities that are at the forefront of this work. So beginning with uh, Seattle's Chinatown International District, uh, the community Asian Americans uh, within the neighborhood are divided between two options on where to place the next multi-billion dollar light rail uh, expansion project. And in doing so, it was listed as one of the National Trust's 11 most endangered places uh, for the cohort of 2023. This also includes Philadelphia's Chinatown, uh, where Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation and other community groups are fighting against the, uh, the development of an arena. Both Philadelphia and Seattle's Chinatown were the first instances of Chinatowns being listed on the National Trust's 11 Most Endangered Places program in its 36-year history. And so Putting Chinatowns and ethnic enclaves at the forefront uh, is something relatively new, even though we've been talking about it and advocating together as a coalition. Uh, this is an explicit step towards, uh, you know, the, that alert level of endangerment. Um, but we also see that Chinatown in Manhattan is facing one of the largest or tallest uh, jail projects in the world. Uh, there's a site in uh, in Manhattan's Chinatown that has a, a current jail, but it has been demolished already, and it's being proposed to have an even taller jail be placed in it. Um, community members are are concerned about this because they felt like they didn't have uh, input into the process. So organizations like Think Chinatown or Welcome to Chinatown and uh, Youth Against Displacement are 
various levels of community engagement from different perspectives. Some use creative placemaking, some use cultural activation, some use regular traditional community organizing and protesting. And those are different ways that community members, especially of a multi-generational collection, are confronting this jail project. Uh, right now, we know that the work to build that new jail is technically approved and it's proceeding, but uh, no one has placed a bid on this multi, uh, multi billion or maybe hundred million dollar project. Um, so there is kind of a, a lag time in between on the next stage of that. But looking to other, you know, non-urban settings of our historic uh, historic sites, we look to Minidoka Concentration Camp and National Historic Site in Idaho that's facing a wind project. Uh, the photo that you see on screen is an artistic rendering to create dramatic effect of what uh, wind turbines would look like at the edge of, uh, of the Minidoka site. Uh, and so right now it's going through that technical process that I mentioned in our three prong approach. It's waiting for um, Section 106 and NEPA and those kinds of uh, federal agency review processes that is supposed to incorporate local community input. But because of a technical and uh, a policy level understanding of of who gets to make the ultimate decision in these, sometimes our community members uh, are you know, displaced not only from the physical site, but also from the uh, the self-actualization of what the site would look like moving forward. Uh, so Friends of Minidoka is leading this uh, leading this work. You'll see here some of the graphics that they put out to show the, um, the height and the scale of just one wind turbine, uh, but the project itself will feature 250 to 400 uh, wind turbines, and they're trying to either reduce reduce the number and push uh, push back where the uh, the turbines would be seen in the horizon. But similarly, this also isn't the only uh, Japanese incarceration, Japanese American incarceration site that's under threat. Uh, Thule Lake uh, Concentration Camp and National Monument in California uh, is once again seeing the the next level the next step of a fencing project that actually originated in 2017 but i just received an email earlier this week that's saying that there's action to be taken to uh to protest and to speak against the the continuation of this fence project so that's been going on for uh close to seven years now where the threat is still looming and there's not a clear win or a clear no build option uh that's been put on the table um so a lot of these campaigns, um, once my I, my next colleague begins presenting, I'll drop the links in the chat to, to see those action steps for each one. You'll see the fence here uh, uh, required or uh, supposedly required by the, um, the FAA surrounding this airport, but also being sensitive to the um, to the actual National Monument site. And so that's being led by Densho and Thule Lake Committee. And then we also uh, turn to the our, our Pacific Islander um, uh, colleagues in in Maui and in Hawaii, obviously with the wildfires of last year, it absolutely devastated the Lahaina Historic District, including National Historic Landmarks. This was the seed of, uh, the, of the Kingdom of Hawaii, and we see wildfires, uh, you know, taking out more than 80% of, of the historic buildings and sites there. And so there are organizations working on it, including the, um, the Lahaina Restoration Foundation. Um, thanks to some of the documentation that was done by students and professionals, you know, HABS drawings, that's which is a historic preservation tool in the 19s, uh, 1960s and 70s, there has been uh, progressive steps towards restoring and rebuilding uh, the Lahaina Historic District. But, you know, we still need to advocate resources and attention to it rather than just say, oh, well, that's that's outside of my community. That's across the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, they're doing their own thing over there. We definitely want to support them um, where we're familiar with on the mainland in any way that we can. And so, like I mentioned, um, API HIP is not necessarily involved in all of these, but as uh, local communities want to include us or seek additional support or, or guidance, um, we definitely love to make those connections uh, from the, the national stage that, at which we sit at. 
And so one collective response to all of this work of continued endangerment of our historic uh, communities, neighborhoods, ethnic enclaves, and individual sites, uh, our flagship program is a national convening uh, every, every two years with only the skipped one during the pandemic in 2022. API HIP is excited to announce the return of our National Asian Pacific Islander American Historic Preservation Forum in Seattle in uh, September 12th through 15th of this year. Right now, we're looking for call for sessions uh, through, the, through the month of April. And so please reach out if you have ideas and, uh, and session proposals on how to best engage with our national, uh, national convening with community members from, from all across the country. But uh, I'm eager to hear from my, my colleagues. I know uh, Rosalind Segarra with uh, LA Conservancy is on our uh, API HIPS board of directors. So we're glad to have that, that LA connection, but I'll catch uh, the rest of you in the chat and looking forward to the, uh, the conversation ahead. Thanks so much, we really appreciate that wonderful presentation. And uh, now I'd like to welcome Rosalind Sagara. Rosalind. Okay. Um, hi everyone, my name is Rosalind Sagara and um, I'm wearing two hats today. Um, one as an advocate and um, board chair of the Save Our Chinatown Committee, which is a nonprofit based in Riverside, California and also as a staff member of the Los Angeles Conservancy. Um, so I'm gonna talk about both Riverside and LA Chinatown, Ch Chinatowns, excuse me. Um, I wanna highlight some of the issues, um, some of the learnings that we've had, and then a couple of updates. Happy to be here with you today. Um, so I wanted to start with Riverside's Chinatown. So for those who um, may be um, familiar with this site um, or those who may not, I just wanted to give kind of a brief snapshot of um, the, you know, the importance of this place. So Riverside's Chinatown is currently um, a historic archeological site. Um, in the 1970s, the last um, remaining buildings were bulldozed um, because they were perceived to be a nuisance. And um, th this happened um, at following the death of the, of the last resident and longtime caretaker of Riverside Chinatown, which was George Wong, who's pictured in the middle. Um, he's pictured here in the middle in 1968 when the county um, designated the property as um, a county landmark. And actually since the 1960s, since before um, the buildings were torn down, um, there had been community involvement in um, preserving the site and thinking about kind of its long-term protection and legacy. And so over the years through 1990, um, community-led efforts resulted in designation of the site at all levels of government. Um, I wanted to point to the image on the right, which is an image of one of the, um, the, the, the test excavation pits that were, um, were excavated during the mid-1980s. Um, really as a public effort to learn more about this important early um, overseas Chinatown site. Um, it is considered to be the most intact early Chinatown site in the country. And for that reason, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And so in 2018, um, there was a medical office proposed for the site which um, the community opposed. And um, after kind of um, a long process, including um, a lawsuit, um, we were able to overturn um, the, the project, which, which had been approved and, um, and saved the site for the time being. Um, the site um, 
currently remains undeveloped and um, our group, the Save Our Chinatown Committee, has been um, working hard to um, really secure um, a long-term um, preservation solution for the site. Um, we have offered um, a lot of input as to what we would like to see. Um, we believe that this site would be um, a wonderful place of learning and really um, being a place where um, the community can really um, benefit from, from learning about this history and, um, and kind of bringing a public use to the site. Um, I wanted to just um, highlight a couple of the projects that we have been involved with in, in helping to bring attention to this cause and also to share the history of um, Riverside's Chinese pioneers. So um, in the middle, you see um, some of us at the site with, with a bunch of um, large tumbleweeds. We, um, we created a community cleanup um, some years ago, and um, it's really been an opportunity to get out um, Get, get closer to the site and bring people together um, in an act of community service and also um, in a community activity that is, um, you know, allowing us to give back to the community. Um, we have also, um, since 20, um, well, 2009, revived um, a traditional um, custom of honoring one's ancestors at our local um, cemetery. So many of our Riverside's Chinese pioneers were um, were here and had left their families in, in China. And so some of these familial traditions were carried on by fellow, um, fellow countrymen, kinsmen, um, who maybe were not um, in fact related but because of the importance of the tradition, um, maintained it while um, the Riverside Chinatown community um, was thriving. When that community started to dwindle, we, start, we started to see this practice kind of go away. And um, we, as an organization, thought it was important to bring this back, not only as a way to honor and respect our um, you know, historical pioneers, but also to allow the public to learn more about our culture. Um, and so we celebrate this, um, this practice um, in the spring. Um, it's referred to as Qingming. Some of you may have um, heard of it. It's very similar to um, the Mexican tradition of Dia de los Muertos. And actually, um, we are um, we are going to be hosting our um, our Qingming um, the week after Saturday. Um, I think it's April fourth, but I may have the date wrong. Um, but this will be our first Qingming that we um, will be doing in person since um, coming out of the COVID pandemic. So we're really excited to bring that back. Um, and then just um, very quickly. On the left is an image of our Riverside Asian American walking tour. This is a program that we launched um, in partnership with some other um, Asian American um, community-based organizations in the area um, to take people um, to various um, sites of significance to AAPI um, history in Riverside. Um, the tour is about an hour and a half long, and um, it's it's been really greatly received. Um, so now I want to turn to Los Angeles Chinatown, and um, just kind of highlight um, a couple of the issues um, that we're seeing um, we're seeing in the neighborhood. And um, first, I wanted to say that um, you know. In a neighborhood, there's going to be a lot of different um, development projects that 
we are going to be seeing some, some of them um, are providing a benefit to the community and some are not. Um, and so we um, at the LA Conservancy um, are working with community members to, um, to look at those developments and, and comment on, on those that um, we feel are harmful to the community. Um, kind of taking a, a broader view of um, kind of um, current and future development um, of the neighborhood. The city of Los Angeles has recently um, updated their downtown community plan, which um, incorporates uh, Los Angeles Chinatown. And through that process, it's a multi-year process that, um, you know, it, it, um, it allows um, community to, to provide input, but it's also very hard to kind of maintain that um, engagement over the years. But um, we were um, able to partner with community members to develop a community asset map that really brought um, decision makers attention to the important places in Chinatown um, and to really kind of let them know that um, there was there were a lot of unique aspects of Chinatown that they may have missed. Um, so um, that community plan has been updated and we are working to stay engaged in the implementation of new programs that um, we, we hope will benefit um, Chinatown. Um, we've been involved in um, uh, designating a um, historic cultural monument, our local landmark of the Bank of America um, Chinatown branch. Um, there are very few landmarks um, designated at the local level that come from Chinatown. Um, in fact, um, I think there was um, the statistic that Lynn brought up um, in terms of national designations. Um, Los Angeles is actually lower than the national um, statistic in terms of um, AAPI heritage sites at the local level. Um, only 2% of our local landmarks um, are associated with Asian American Pacific Islander um, heritage. Um, and then just a couple of other things. We have um, launched a legacy business initiative and grant program. Um, we um, were really happy to award two businesses in LA Chinatown a small grant um, last year that's helping them continue to thrive and, um, and um, stay in Chinatown. On the left, we see Kelly and Judy of Hop Wu Restaurant. Um, so that, that's something very um, positive that we're seeing in terms of uh, what's working. Um, and then I would just say um, to the left, you know, in terms of, um, I'm sorry, to the right, what's next? Um, we we are seeing like um, in some of the other Chinatowns that um, we mentioned, infrastructure projects that are posing threat to neighborhood cohesion and identity. And in LA, um, there is a, um, a, gondola projects that's being proposed um, from basically um, from Union Station to Dodger Stadium. Um, and um, Chinatown stakeholders have been very vocal in their opposition to the project. Um, we also have opposed the project and we're hoping to stay engaged as that moves along um, in the process. So I'm gonna close now and welcome your comments. Thanks so much, Rosalind. Really appreciate it. And uh, now I'd like to, now we're heading over to what's happening in Philadelphia with, with Debbie Way. I'm gonna be talking about what's happening in Philadelphia, Chinatown. And um, I think it's really important uh, to note that, um, our Chinatown is 150 years old, not quite as old as the West Coast Chinatowns, but um, 
we do have what we like to call a resistant, a tradition of resistance. And I'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, the thing that I want to talk about in particular in terms of this resistance is that you'll see a pattern across time of um, resistance to efforts to displace Chinatown being led from a multi-generational standpoint. Um, and I, these are just pictures from my personal photo album, but the picture on the left is uh, Chiang Kai-jong. He's 73 now. Um, I know we, we say, <laughs> what is that saying? Asian don't reason? Yeah, he, he's a very young 73 in this picture. Um, the little boy next to him is my oldest son, Peter. He was 12 at the time. He is now 36. Um, and on the right side, and that was during the fight against the baseball stadium in 2000. And on the right side is the fight against the casino, the first casino proposal, which was in 2008. Um, and in the back is my daughter, Kaya, um, and the front is her best friend um, since childhood, Taryn, and they were five and six years old at the time. Um, and I wanted to point out these t-shirts because you'll see that Chiang Kai-jong is wearing um, version 1.0, which was the t-shirt that was designed when they put the state, when they proposed the stadium. And T-shirt version 2.0, the girls are wearing uh, when they propose the casino. And we are currently all wearing version 3.0, um, which is now the arena. Um, as I said, Philly Chinatown, 150 years old, but I do think um, like all Chinatowns across the United States, they started as ghettos. They started in places that no one else wanted to live. And they were um, pretty much, uh, you know, not wanted. So a lot of the early headlines that you'll see in the Philadelphia papers were around um, acts that were designed to um, harass and hopefully uh, make Chinese leave the area. Um, we also saw our share of what uh, communities of color across the, the country saw urban renewal, but we called it urban removal, targeting communities of color, um, labeling them as blight. And you can see here um, some of the projects, but I do have a video because we've been talking about this for so long that uh, my friends created this video so I don't have to say the same story over and over again. <laughs> but also keeping it concise. Chinese came to the East Coast to escape incredible violence that was happening to them on the West Coast. And this is just one example in LA. One day, October 24th, 1871, 18 Chinese were killed in that one day. 15 of them were lynched. Altogether, they killed 10% of the Chinese population of LA that day. And therefore, it's no wonder that Philly's Chinatown started the same year that something like this happened. But this was not the only incident. This was happening all over the American West and in Canada. Chinatown started 150 years ago, rough areas, 8th to 11th, and eventually a little bit past 11th. Vine, a little bit past Vine, to a little bit past race going toward Arch. Okay, that was the boundaries in the beginning. The first incursion was when they built the Broad Street Line Spur, the Broad Ridge Spur. You see the, the spur took all the land on a diagonal between 8th and 9th Street. This was the first taking of land in Chinatown. Then we go to the 70s, and that's when they decided to do this thing called urban renewal. Chinatown was considered blighted. They decided to build the expressway in a way that would have wiped out Chinatown. When they made that design, the design also took the Holy Redeemer Church and School, and that's when the community went, oh, hell no, like this is the only place where Chinese feel safe. You are not taking this building. But you see that our young people, sitting up here on the rubble, 
trying to block the bulldozers from advancing. They moved the exit ramps over in order to save Holy Redeemer Church, but we still lost. All the housing in that swath was lost. This is a time lapse that gives you a sense of what the Vine Street Expressway did to us. This here, this little street here, that's Vine Street, which is now that six lane highway. And then we got the 80s. We have the convention center, 200 people lost their homes as a result of the convention center. And then they also built the commuter rail tunnel, which was a block that ran underneath the same block that the Broadridge Spur was on. And so they raised all the housing. This is the last house that was standing between 8th and 9th Street. They lasted as long as they could, but the city took everything by eminent domain. But the graffiti on the side says, our forefathers built the railroad. We didn't think it would come this far. So in the 1990s, they also proposed a federal prison. I'm telling you, Chinatown has had everything and the kitchen sink thrown into it. So the federal prison was going to go the north side of Vine Street, right next to Holy Redeemer. We fought that. We won. We kept them from coming in. And on that land now stands Hinghua Yun and Singhua Yun, which are affordable housing complexes built for people in the community. And that takes us to 2000. This is like the fight that many people remember, kind of a legendary fight against the Phillies wanting to put a baseball stadium here. Our elders are on the front lines, our children are on the front lines. To give you a sense of this multi-generational organizing, I just pulled a few of my family pictures. This over here, Chen Kai Zhong, he's 73 at the time. And when we had our protest on June 10th, he insisted on speaking. He's 96. She goes, I have to speak. I have, the young people need to see that we are still fighting for them. And over here, is the casino fight, because we also had to fight off a casino in 2008. So this gives you a sense of that red line being sort of Chinatown, the Vine Street Expressway, the commuter rail tunnel, the convention center. You see that big, huge mass that took all that housing. Those were the things that got built. And then we have the proposed things, the federal prison, that gray, is where the stadium would have been. Down here was the proposed Foxwood Casino. And then right next to it, that blue, that's the basketball arena that's being proposed right now. So Chinatown has this incredible history of trying to fight off development projects all designed to kill the community. Okay, um, so, well, I just wanted to um, say that one of the things that I got wrong in that video was the first taking of land was actually in 1923 when they took the Chinatown SRO, which is on the corner of 9th and Ray Street. Um, what Chinatown actually is today, it's a community. We have 4,000 residents. Um, two elementary schools, four churches, two temples, more than 250 small family run businesses. It depends on where you want to put the borders of Chinatown. We have festivals, we have, um, you know, uh, cultural traditions um, and Chinatown remains a community. Um, Asian Americans United, which is the organization that I founded in 1985 and have been involved with a, a lot of these fights over the years. Um, um, we have a motto. We say we fight the things we don't want. We build the things we do want. So um, we started the annual Mid-Autumn Festival in Chinatown, um, I think. Goodness, I want to say, you know, going on 20 some years ago. Um, oh, it's been a long time that we've had this festival. Um, and then where they built the stadium, we were told, don't worry, we're, this was the uh, air, land north of Vine Street because they had already taken all the land um, because of Vine Street and cut the community in, two, in, in half. And so north of Vine Street, um, it was very hard to jump that highway. 
And in 2000, the city was saying, you'll never use that land for anything. Um, and since 2000, these are some of the things that we've built there. The Hoyu Arts and Cultural Center, um, they're big. If you are in the area and you have time, come to Chinatown this Sunday. It is the only place outside of Chinatown, I mean, outside of China, that you will see this uh, festival called the Wandering Gods from Hoyu, China. We have a large number of Hoyu um, residents in Chinatown. Um, Hoyu is in uh, the province of, you know, in Fuzhou. Um, and we have a lot of Fujianese immigrant residents, but they have these large puppets. They kind of look a little scary, but <laughs> they're actually uh, deities um, that are paraded in the street. Um, and it's actually a big, I just found out is a very big tourist attraction in China to go to Changle and Hoyu at this time of year to see, or when, when they do the wandering gods. Um, so we're very lucky that, uh, Philly is the one place in all of North America and maybe in the world outside of China that you can see this. I'm pretty sure it's the only place else in the world. Um, we built our own elementary school, Folk Arts Cultural Treasures Charter School. Uh, this was after a lot of debate within Asian Americans United because in general, we support public education. We don't think charter schools are an answer, but we had sued the school district and been working for decades for change in the district um, in terms of language access and um, basically just general conditions for immigrant children and families. And there wasn't any movement. And we thought, well, let's just start a school and see if our theoretical beliefs of what would make schools work um, work. And so um, I was the first principal of facts we opened in 2005. Um, by 2011, we became a blue ribbon school. Um, when I opened, I don't know the statistics now. I, I left in 2010, but um, when we opened, we were 86% free and reduced lunch, and the other 14% uh, percent were children of uh, teachers and founders. Um, in the footprint of the stadium as well, we have the Asian Arts Initiative and the Chinese Christian Church has built an annex. Um, this particular fight is a little bit different um, because we're dealing with what is now called the financialization of housing. And that is uh, private equity has taken over the housing market um, you see billboards like this all across the country. I'm sure you have them in your area. Um, and these equity investors are buying up properties and trading them on Wall Street. So we now have a human right of housing being traded on Wall Street. Um, so these three uh, billionaires who are trying to build the arena are all equity investors in real estate. Um, they are all multi-billionaires. Um, our fights in the past have been governmental fights. Um, this is a new one and a much bigger one um, in many ways than what we've had to deal with in the past because they have more resources <laughs> and more resources than God to throw into this thing. So um, we've been fighting for almost two years now. These are the three billionaires. And yes, I'm kind of petty because I did kind of find the worst pictures of them on the internet. But um, David Edelman has already, um, he owns campus apartments. They started in Philadelphia. They now run uh, campus housing across the country. Um, he already worked ceaselessly to gentrify a historically black neighborhood in West Philadelphia. Josh Harris, um, Apollo Global, one of the biggest equity firms in the world. And um, David Blitzer is the global head of tactical opportunities for Blackstone. Um, most of you may have heard of Blackstone. Um, they don't have a great track record in this country and they don't have a good track record across the world. The United Nations actually um, wrote a letter of um, sanctioning Blackstone um, and in that, uh, the UN Rapporteur for the Right to Housing said, quote, 
they were causing a worldwide housing crisis, end quote. Um, in terms of where this thing is gonna be, uh, the back wall of the arena is there and that's our first business. They've slapped this 28 story uh, apartment tower on top of their AI generated designs. And this is pretty much all we've got to go on. They don't have real designs. They don't have real, um, their thing is that they won't invest the money for real designs until they know that they have the, um, zoning and, and permits that they need to build. And those are the things that we've been blocking for two years. Um, I did reach out to the UN Rapporteur for Housing, uh, Leilani Farha. I found that she worked now works now at a UN organized organization called The Shift that's uh, fighting the financialization of housing. And she listened to us. She did a lot of research with her associate, Sam, um, they interviewed a lot of people in Chinatown and they issued a letter on our behalf to the city of Philadelphia. And that letter cited a, a number of things. Now, usually UN things, UN human rights don't apply too much to the US because the US doesn't sign on to any of the human rights things, but they have signed on to a couple, including CERD, um, the Convention for the Elimination of R Racial Discrimination. And these are excerpts from the letter that clearly um, indicate some important things as vis-a-vis -vis, um, racial discrimination in this case. Um, I did wanna point out, and in the video, I pointed out that um, Chiang Kai-jong, who's 96, but I also wanted to point out the two young ladies, my daughter and her best friend, Taryn, from elementary school. Um, they have now organized the Students for the Preservation of Chinatown, and they are organizing university students across um, the city to oppose the arena, largely because all three developers have very, very close relationships to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, not only does David Edelman run the privatized housing, but Josh Harris and David Blitzer sit on their board of trustees and graduated from Wharton. Um, Wharton School tends to turn out lovely people, I think. Uh, <laughs> I did wanna point out these last two quotes. Um, um, I like to buy my candy in Chinatown. The man in the store knows me. He always smiles and he calls me by my Chinese name. That was my middle son when he was nine. When I asked him why, he used his red envelope money, which was quite limited to buy candy, which he really liked um, in Chinatown at the laundromat when he could get it cheaper at like say CVS. And that was his answer to me. And I realized even at nine years old that he had schooled me on the importance of what community is and what actually preservation is. Cause to us our community is not, um, it's not buildings, it's, it's relationships and it's memory and it's history. And those things matter a whole lot more than money, but because they cannot be financially measured, um, the values in our community, the value of our community um, isn't taken into account. Um, and my daughter talked about being able to run around Chinatown, being able to find her identity in these festivals that are um, held and there she is again with her best friend. <laughs> um, one thing we have done is win the hearts and minds of the people in Philadelphia. We have a large number of organizations that have just um, come out against the arena or even formed um, five of the six logos that you see up there formed as a result of fighting the arena. Um, and so our opposition is quite robust um, and we're still in it. So happy to answer questions um, and I'll stop my share. All right, I welcome everyone, uh, all of our pres presenters to come on to on the screen. Uh, we do have a few more minutes uh, and we'd love to take some questions, but uh, I had a question I wanted to pose to all three of you. Uh, first, um, how do you uh, attract uh, or interest young people in 
um, during the fight um, and 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 taking up the preservation of uh, these sites impo important to Asian and Pacific Islander Americans. Yeah, I can jump into that one. Um, as I mentioned, with our you know three layer approach, our bridging of next generation coalition really begins at that um, public outreach level, at the educational level, um, and meeting them where they're at. Uh, whether it's that they care about um, you know digital media or restaurants and experiences, utilizing those kind of open doors as a path towards making that history connection, right? So we're featuring legacy businesses in our work. We're featuring emerging histories. We're talking about um, uh, digital media engagement, including our, our TikTok account. Um, but it's like the first step into reframing these places that they might know as like a cool place to visit um, into like a, oh, this site is worthy of preservation because of the uh, the history and heritage and, and community that's embodied in these places. I would just say, um, you know, I love to hear that De um, in Deborah's presentation that there's a students for the Philly Chinatown. There's also been a students for Chinatown and Riverside also. So I think that when students, young people learn about the threats or the issues that are going on in our in our neighborhoods, you know, where they feel like connected to, they they get involved and they 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 do it in in the ways that make sense for them. I think back uh, on one of the um, responses that one of our students um, who was um, a leader in in that effort, saying like when asked what does Chinatown mean to you? And she answered, you know, Chinatown is like my friend. Um, and I think that that's kind of getting at what I think Deb, Deborah was, was sharing about like the values that our, um, our folks have and, and how passionate they feel and connected to these places. Um, and I would, just, um, I think ours is very local. And I think one of the things that we've done, um, for example, Mid-Autumn Festival relies on 350 high school volunteers to run. And we do that on purpose because we know that for young people creating memories and connections to place, um, we, we know that we're gonna need them to fight. We need to give them a reason to fight for. Um, and so we try to build in opportunities for young people to create memories in, in a place. Um, and it's actually become quite the, the, the thing when you're old enough to volunteer for Mid-Autumn Festival, that's like sort of a, a thing, but it's also like where young people go and check each other out. And I'm not naive. <laughs> and Sheila, I think we have a question in the Q&A. Yes, so we had a couple. Um, John had a question about any other AAPI sites that you can think of that are not designated at a state or national level, but should be. He was particularly interested in California. We um, responded, but I didn't know if um, Debbie or Roslyn had any other ideas um, regarding that. And then Juan also wanted to add if there was any overall listing of AAPI endangered sites, regardless of their status, and you know how could that be accessed? Um, we thank you for for writing those answers, uh, Debbie or Roslyn. Did you have anything to add by chance? Um, maybe I would add that um, the city of Los Angeles and also the city of Riverside have um, developed historic context statements um, that have identified potential or eligible properties. And so happy to share the links to those reports um, with the folks on the webinar. Um, of course, those reports don't always um, get everything um, right. And so we really rely on our community um, to, to bring, um, to, to let us know what those endangered places are. And so um, I think in terms of um, kind of putting, maintaining an endangered sites list, that is something that API HIP I think has 
tried to do um, in the past. And, um, you know, it, it may be something that um, can can continue maybe in the future. Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously Chinatown's all over the country, right? Um, so many of them are endangered, but in Philadelphia, um, Wabin Plaza um, was one of the first places for Vietnamese refugee resettlement, um, small business development. They actually were bought by a developer, but has been sitting vacant for, I think, four or five years now. Um, and uh, Viet Lead actually has done a documentary about the loss of Wabin Plaza. So it's already gone, unfortunately. Thank you. And I see um, in our chat, Catherine was wondering about the role of coalition building in issues of AA um, PI sites, environmental groups, other agencies. Um, any thoughts upon how uh, how you can reach coalition groups? Yeah, for uh, for API HIP at the national level, there's lots of coalitions that we find ourselves in, whether it's on the first half of our name or the second half, right? And so with uh, with Asian American and Pacific Islanders or Asian Pacific Islander Americans, we're in um, looking to see uh, coalition and groups like the National um, Coalition for Asian Pacific Americans, which is a federal policy group. Um, as well as, you know, our, our colleagues at National Capacity who do a lot of community development in oftentimes historic ethnic enclaves. Um, and then on the historic preservation side, APIA HIP shows up as the um, kind of the figurehead representing Asian Pacific Islander Americans, whether it's with preservation action, doing federal po preservation policy, um, the National Preservation Partners Network, uh, which is consisting of preservation nonprofits, um, working with state historic preservation officers, right? And making sure that like there is an Asian Pacific Islander American perspective and advocacy for um, the, the communities that we bring into the conversation. Wonderful. Um, and and I would just say, like, again, my I tend to be like, I'm the grassroots organizer person. So um, not so much nationally, but for us in Philadelphia, China, Asian American political power is quite limited. Um, it's been really important for us, Asian Americans United as an organization, to maintain consistent ties with Black and Brown communities um, who also are fighting displacement. And those relationships have really helped us in this particular fight um, because. Uh, we just show up for each other. And it's been really important to have non-Asians showing up for us in this fight. All right, well, thank you. Well, that's a great way to, to wrap it up. Um, we're at time. Uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us and thank you to Hui, Debbie and Rosalind for your time and your wonderful presentations. Um, again, uh, our this will be this is being recorded. We'll place it on the ACHP YouTube channel. Please join us again for all of our webinars, the two remaining uh, in the next couple of months. And um, don't forget to follow the ACHP on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks again, everybody. Bye.